If there is ever a release from Earth, akin to the flight of birds, this is it. For many, this aerial ballet may seem like a dangerous pursuit. But to the aerobatic pilot, it's a passion. A passion that has driven aviation since the birth of flight. This strange looking machine in a beet field is the Breca Riche gyroplane. For millennia, ever since humans have looked up at the sky, and seen birds fly. They wanted to fly too. There was this very ancient dream. And it's only in this century, really, that we have realized that dream. But in one of those ironies of life, because it's now within our grasp, it's become very mundane. People see it as only a form of transportation. Maybe they've forgotten what it was like to look up in the sky and dream of being able to wheel and soar with the birds. Six years ago, Cecilia Aragon was a computer programmer with a fear of flying. She conquered her fear by going up with a friend for an aerial view of San Francisco. Two years later, she had her instructor's rating and was teaching others to fly. Now Cecilia is a first-time member of the United States aerobatic team. Patty Wagstaff is a veteran on that team and the reigning U.S. national aerobatic champion. Her goal is to be the best in the world. But in her three previous bids for the international title, she's come up short. Patty's made a career of aerobatics, performing in air shows across the country most months of the year. When I started flying, I couldn't imagine just flying straight and level for the rest of my life. The first thing I really wanted to do was aerobatics. I'd always loved roller coasters and, and going fast, speed, you know, just being a little bit on the edge, that type of thing. I remember my, my girlfriends would have pictures of, um, you know, the Beatles on the wall and um, things like that, castles and things, unicorns, and I'd always have pictures of airplanes and uh, tails of 747s or DC-8s or whatever they were. Members of the United States aerobatic team have gathered at Rickenbacker Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio for a week of practice together. Five men and five women have left their jobs and families for the chance to represent America at the 1992 World Aerobatic Championship in La Havre, France. They are the best aerobatic pilots in America, but they're much more than aviators. They're athletes mechanics, inventors. They are the Renaissance people of aviation. More than many of their contemporaries in commercial or military flight, these pilots retain the spirit of flying that began 90 years ago. Even before their first powered flight, the Wright brothers were convinced that pilots should have full three-dimensional control of an aircraft. They used elevators to control lift, rudders to turn, and they invented wing warping, a system of cables that enabled pilots to twist the plane's wings to roll or bank. On the 20th of September, 1904, the Wrights achieved a 360-degree bank turn that lasted a minute and a half. Recognizing that a plane should bank its wings in order to turn was a revolution in aviation. Wing warping had made possible the first aerobatic-type maneuver in history. European inventors liked what they saw. They rushed to copy the Wright brothers' design, but they drew the line at wing warping. They believed airplanes shouldn't roll at all. It was much too dangerous. As a result, their planes could fly safely only in the absence of wind. But one French inventor agreed with the Wright brothers. Louis Blériot gave up a successful automobile business to build and fly airplanes. 
He'd already experimented with ways to control lift and direction. Now, he risked personal fortune to build a plane with wing warping as well. In 1909, less than a year after Wilbur Wright first demonstrated wing warping in France, Louis Blériot reserved a place for himself in aviation history. The event which really made aviation headline news and brought it into the consciousness of people all over the world was Louis Blériot's flight across the channel. The flight itself was of little importance because he only flew for approximately half an hour, but for the first time someone had flown across a sea, and especially a border, and a country that had always felt protected by the seas could now all of a sudden be invaded by airplanes. It was an extraordinary idea. Within weeks of the channel crossing, the French city of Rheims staged the world's first major aviation exhibition. More than 300,000 spectators gathered to witness for themselves this phenomena of flight. Prizes totaling 200,000 francs were offered to pilots who excelled in speed, altitude, and endurance. The speed contest pitted Louis Blériot against American aviation pioneer Glenn Curtis. Curtis's plane had hinged panels between the wings, the forerunners of today's ailerons. Replacing wing warping with ailerons was the second major advance in aviation. It made possible the construction of airplanes with stronger, more rigid wings, airplanes that could fly faster, further, and with greater precision. The public's fascination with aviation was growing. In the next year alone, more than 20 air shows in Europe and a dozen more in America attracted huge crowds. Pilots were becoming more confident in their flying machines and in their ability to keep them under control. For aerobatic pilots today, control is everything. It's the foundation on which the sport is built. Phil Knight is an electrical contractor from Florida. He, like his teammates, takes the sport of aerobatics to a higher level, each infusing it with the style indicative of their individual personalities and experiences. Phil's two combat tours as a helicopter pilot in Vietnam could account for his aggressive flight profile. If I'm going to make a roll on a vertical line, uh, I'm not going to put a partial input in or move the stick part way. I'm going to put the stick all the way to the stop. And I'm going to hold it there until I feel like I'm where I should be and I'm going to take it out immediately, abruptly. And, and there was a lot of lines that I didn't set where I wanted them. But... Uh, through trial and error and through a lot of practice and, and a lot of gas, uh, I got the aircraft to where we became a team and uh, I hit my lines just about every time now. Good. Coaching the team is John Morrissey. He provides the team with a ground level perspective of their aerobatic routines. The same view Vertical. the judges will have at the competition. Okay, that's a good 45. One, he must be the purist, two, reminding the, the pilots of the basics as they perfect their routines. Nice from the 45. In modern day flight training programs, one is basically taught to fly parallel to a tabletop. Yes, there are slight climbs, there are slight descents, there are moderate banks up to about 60 degrees either side of level. But that is plane geometry, if I can make the metaphor. Solid geometry, the third dimension, the vertical dimension, is aerobatics. And so there's basically only four lines in aerobatics. There's the horizontal line, there's the vertical line, and what's halfway in between, but a 45 degree line, and there's the circular line. The precision of maneuvers along these lines separates great aerobatic pilots from good ones. The keys to perfection are practice and physical conditioning. Conditioning means building up a tolerance to G's, the extreme forces of gravity a pilot experiences when performing these maneuvers. If I start flying in March, it's not until May or June that I develop a decent G tolerance. It really takes a lot of practice and a lot of time. If you don't, if you go out 
early in the season and you push too many Gs, you can break blood vessels in your brain or you can snap something in your brain. You can develop vertigo, which is really not uncommon with competition aerobatic pilots. And I think it really boils down to having a real healthy respect for, uh, for your body and for your, for your brain. During her routine, Patty will experience up to 12 Gs, or 12 times the normal force of gravity, increasing her weight to between 900 and 1,400 pounds. She'll also experience negative Gs when she performs an outside maneuver, one that forces blood into the upper part of her body and head. It's an experience that is almost exclusive to aerobatic pilots. Positive Gs are not a problem. When you're pulling positive Gs, you're being forced back into your seat and you're, you know, you're being pushed into the plane. But when you push negative Gs and you push outside, you're being forced out of the plane. And we push out, you know, six, seven, eight negative Gs, sometimes more, and um, being forced out of the plane at uh, 250 miles an hour at eight negative Gs, um, You'd probably go right through the canopy, actually. And I've seen a couple of holes put through canopies with, because of seatbelts that are broken. I would think something with a little more... Uh, I was thinking about taking this double snap and put it at the end. That, or uh, something like... By uh, weeks in, the pilots have spent hours thinking about their routines, adding new maneuvers, discarding others, all in an effort to assemble the most effective combination. One which they feel can be executed perfectly at the world contest. You could even put three of these in your uh, freestyle. But no matter how complex or difficult their routines become, they all start with four basic maneuvers. Demonstrating the four basic maneuvers is aerobatic instructor Mike Gulliam. We're going to initiate our roll. Right amount of left rudder and left aileron. As we come through the knife edge position, we're going to add right rudder and forward stick to continue the roll rate and keep the nose above the horizon. As the aircraft rotates continually, we're going to now come in with left rudder and some back stick to keep the nose on the horizon and finish upright in level flight. The roll was the brainchild of French pilot Celestin Adolf Pegu. Pegu invented the roll quite by accident while testing a revolutionary new safety device for Louis Blériot, the parachute. Pegu décolle, saute, le parachute s'ouvre, et tout se passe. Pegu takes off, jumps, the parachute opens, and everything happens as planned. But while he's floating down, Pegu sees his plane performing unusual maneuvers, somersaults, things that he had never seen it do before. Blériot witnesses the same thing. We mustn't forget that in 1913, when airplanes flew, it was straight and level all the time. There was very little tilting, very little climbing. And here, what do people see? They see an airplane performing somersaults. Blériot says to Begu, we should try and recreate this. Within days, Begu recreated what the plane had done on its own. He had invented the roll. 200 miles an hour, we're going to start a nice 3G, 4G pull up here. Looking at our left wing tip at the horizon to make sure the aircraft rotates. At this point, through the inverted position, we look out the roof and watch the nose come through the horizon. Now our vision globes out through the runway and we can see that the nose is straight. And we're going to finish right back up at 1,500 feet and at our starting airspeed of 200 miles an hour. Within weeks of inventing the roll, Pegu pushed the envelope once again, this time making the airplane do a complete circle, performing what he and his observers were certain was the first inside loop. It has always been said that Pegu made the first loop on the 21st of September 1913. In fact, that is false. It was the second loop. Why? Several months later, a French aviation magazine published a letter sent to them by a Russian officer, Peter Nesterov. He protested. I did the loop before Pegu in the month of August. I pulled back on the stick, and at that point, I did a sort of loop, and then I landed. They would find out later that Peter Nesterov did not do it by accident. He had made previous attempts. This was strictly forbidden in the military, so when Nesterov landed, he was promptly arrested. Once the Russian government realized what Nesterov had accomplished, they promoted him and awarded him with a medal. A year later, Nesterov was killed in combat. When airspeed at 220 miles an hour, we go ahead and make 
up, looking out at the left wing. You can see the wing vertical to the horizon. At this point, airspeed slows. We have full left rudder, right aileron, and slight forward stick. And you can see the runway below us in our vertical attitude out to the left side of the aircraft. As we descend vertical, we pull out at almost 18 and 230 miles per hour. On Christmas Day, 1913, the French aviator Pierre Chanteloup was performing near the English town of Hendon. When his engine quit, just as he began, a loop. His airplane, which was pointed straight up, slid backward, tail first for as much as 400 feet. To recover, Chanteloup made a cartwheel turn and glided safely back to the ground. He had inadvertently invented the third basic maneuver, the stall turn, or hammerhead. The stick now comes all the way back as the rudder goes all the way to the floor and the nose drops through the horizon. There's one turn, one and a half turns, two, two and a half, and we come out right on three. At this point, we're going to look at the wingtip, check our horizon, make sure that the aircraft is vertical at over 180 miles an hour straight and level. The spin, a dangerous enigma that has plagued aviation for decades. For no apparent reason, pilots have found their planes spinning toward the ground with no dependable means of recovery. From 1983 to 89, nearly 400 aviation accidents were in some way spin-related, resulting in nearly 500 deaths. In the 90s, that number has been greatly reduced, largely due to a new spin recovery procedure. Every once in a while, this airplane would be spinning out of control, it'd be coming down, and this guy says, I'm getting out of this thing, I'm going to live. He takes his seatbelts off, and he jumps out of this airplane, and he parachutes. And all of a sudden, hey, wait a second, the airplane's flying again. And after this happened, you know, 20 or 30 times, maybe it's the pilot that's making this thing not recover and not the airplane. And then, after they did all this recovery technique with Gene Beggs and Eric Mueller, they really learned that most airplanes will recover from a spin on their own. And the airplane wants to fly on its own. And if we just let it do its own thing, it's going to recover and everything will be okay. And that's really the emergency spin recovery techniques that we learned today. Power off, hands off, and opposite rudder. And just watch and it'll come out on its own. And that is a big revolution in aerobatics and it saved a lot of lives up till now. World War I. It began in the summer of 1914, and when it ended on November 11th, 1918, it had ushered in an entirely new form of warfare, air combat. The maneuvers invented by Pigot and others were soon more than stunts. They became combat tactics, the tools for survival. The first aerobatic maneuvers, we will call them aerobatic, but at the time the term had not been coined, were strictly forbidden in the army. Therefore, when the first aerial dogfights take place, the pilots have not yet learned how to do a loop. They have not learned how to do any maneuvers that are even the slightest bit inclined. But the important thing is that the pilots themselves have seen Pegu fly. They have seen the others fly. They know that they can fly an airplane in a way that is not necessarily cautious and level. It is possible to dive, to climb, to make steep turns. It is in this respect that aerobatics will benefit aerial combat. The Allies took to the air aggressively. The French were the first to fit an airplane with a machine gun. The Germans countered with their own system and a new airplane, the Fokker Eindecker. It was Germany's first aerial fighting machine. As a result, Allied losses rose dramatically. The period became known as the Fokker Scourge. One German pilot stood out, Max Immelmann. He was renowned for his method of eluding a plane he had just attacked, a maneuver still known today as the Immelmann Turn. It consisted of a half loop up then a half roll to upright. It was not only clever, it was very hard to do. Because there was a good chance the plane would stall and spin to the ground. Two years into the war, the Allies had nearly a two to one advantage in number of aircraft. Still, the Germans were winning the air battle. The life expectancy of an Allied pilot at the front was 
three weeks. The German ace, Baron von Richthofen, commanded an elite fighter squadron, the Flying Circus. They used one airplane in particular to strike fear into the hearts of Allied pilots, the Fokker triplane. Highly maneuverable because of the surface area of the extra wing, it was in this plane that Richthofen, otherwise known as the Red Baron, shot down his 80th victim. Allied commanders knew better training was needed. They began to require student pilots to take courses in aerobatics. In the United States, it was termed basic battle acrobatics and trick flying. By the time the Allies declared victory in November 1918, the airplane had changed the face of warfare, and warfare had changed aviation. Aerobatic skills had been refined, and the airplane had become a more powerful and sophisticated machine. Today's aerobatic pilots are the beneficiaries of these advances. In appearance, little has changed in the planes they fly or the maneuvers they perform. As they gather at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware, the pilots are reminded of one more similarity. Their planes have neither the range nor the instrumentation to fly to Europe. The Air Force provides a solution, but at a premium. More than $100,000 for the use of a C-5A cargo plane, which can carry all of the team's planes to the World Contest in France without any major disassembly. Why not? Go on and watch. It won't hurt. No pilot has been killed during an aerobatic competition in the U.S., but several have died flying their planes to and from competition sites. Additional fuel puts the planes at their maximum weight limits, and still the range is extremely short, about two hours. It's almost an emergency situation as soon as these planes take off. To cut down on weight, aerobatic planes have few navigational instruments. The pilots cannot fly in uncertain weather and cannot take their hands off the controls when they're in the air. They fly cross-country with a compass and a map. Even their planes, particularly the biplanes, have the look and sound of those flown in the barnstorming days of the 20s. Working alone or in groups, barnstormers and flying circuses put surplus World War I aircraft to use. Entertaining huge crowds with aerial stunts. But the pilots were also interested in competing against one another. Two different disciplines resulted. Acrobatics for entertainment and aerobatics for competition. The acrobats invented reckless stunts to keep the stands full. The aerobats invented increasingly complex maneuvers to keep other competitors guessing. But one maneuver eluded both entertainer and competitor, the outside loop. The legendary aviator Jimmy Doolittle, even as a young pilot, knew the outside loop was possible. He just wasn't sure how. The problem was the stresses it would create on the airplane and the pilot because of the extreme forces of negative Gs. But on May 25, 1927, he decided to try it anyway. One of the other test pilots is a chap named Hutchison. So I said, Hutch, will you just stand right where you are and watch that part of the sky, and uh, I am going up and do a stunt. I would like to have you uh, uh, tell me what you think it is. And so I went up and did uh, an outside loop. And when I came down, Hutchison was in ecstasy. He said, why, well, you, you just did an outside loop. Yes. Now, don't say anything about it. I want to keep this very quiet because the next time that we have an acrobatic competition, I'm going to take it hands down with the outside loop. Well, somehow or other, I just leaked. And so uh, I got a call from the chief, Army Chief of Staff, Chief of the Air Force then, and uh, saying that he had just heard that I had done an outside loop, there would be no more. I said, yes, sir. Soon after Doolittle's daring maneuver, new safety rules were imposed, so many pilots turned to a different form of competition, air races. 
our country was the only country that I'm aware of in the world whose aviation developments were in the main contributed by the civilian sector. All the other countries, France, Italy, Britain, Germany, Russia, government-funded development of, of aviation. And so when World War II began to loom, the technology that was utilized to initially give us our military capability, I think up to a large uh, extent, came from our air racers. Now, you have air racers flying aircraft, very fast, uh, high power to weight ratios, fast landing speeds, and so you must develop along with that pilot skills. I mean, the, the, the straight and level 30 degree bank turn is no longer enough of a skill. Air racing and aerobatics depended crucially on pilot skill. The mastery of aerobatics, maintaining control no matter the attitude of the plane, maintaining composure no matter the situation, is the foundation of all military and commercial pilot training. Kermit Weeks is a self-taught aerobatic pilot and a veteran of the World Championships. He hopes to take the top spot in Le Havre this year, but it won't be easy. He flies a biplane. And many pilots believe that biplanes can no longer compete against monoplanes at the world level. Americans have always preferred uh, biplanes because they have a great deal of faith in the structure. And it's a very simple uh, uh, method of construction, very durable and very strong. And uh, they have, uh, this is an old technology that, of course, goes back to the 20s and 30s. So they like it. We've been building airplanes that way for a long time. Plus, we were blessed with the introduction of an airplane in this country in the 60s called the Pitt Special, which really caused aerobatics to take off in the United States. But uh, pilots believe, and uh, they think that this can be proven by the marks that are given by judges, that they are going to score 10 or 15 percent better with a monoplane than they are a biplane. As long as they perceive that, then the monoplane is going to be favored. It's that simple. The Pitt Special revolutionized the sport of aerobatics in the United States. It was rugged, powerful, and most importantly, it was affordable. It led to America's domination in world aerobatic competition in the 70s and early 80s. The Pitt's winning streak ended in the early 80s, due in part to the introduction of this plane, the Sukhoi. Now one of Russia's few successful exports, the Sukhoi dwarfs the pits both in cost and in size. Its $200,000 price tag is four times higher, and it weighs twice as much, debunking the old idea that aerobatic planes had to be small and lightweight. Rick Masaki is the first U.S. team member to fly one. Well, the first time I sat in this thing, uh... Uh, I seemed to be laying down with my knees stuck up in my face and my feet straight up in the air and it was really uh, odd to me after sitting in an airplane uh, upright much like you'd be sitting in a, a kitchen chair uh, is the way the airplanes in the past have been but uh, this is very unique because uh, I recline at about a 60 degree angle and that uh, enables uh, my blood and my body to stay uh, uh, more uh, uh, stationary uh, during high G loads and to be able to maintain consciousness. The first time I got in the airplane, uh, I, this is really, really wild. It was intimidating. I was uh, sitting back, it seemed like I had my feet stuck straight in the air, and the stick was not where it was supposed to be, the throttle was not where it was supposed to be, the engine turned the other way, and it was a massive airplane, it shook, and uh, I thought, boy, what am I getting myself into here? So so the first time I, uh, I took off, um, I thought, boy, if I can just get this thing back on the ground, I'll be doing good. With all the planes and team members on board, spare parts, an extra engine, and all the other supplies the team may need for the next month are loaded. From here, they'll fly to Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, where they'll unload their planes and head for France. At the base of Saginaw Bay in Michigan, one man is designing and building what could be America's answer to the Sukhoi. John Stoddicker's S-300 series is a compilation of design ideas as old as the Wright Flyer, 
as revolutionary as the Russian Sukhoi. When the throttle is down here, your elbow, it sort of hits the side of the fuselage and gets in your way. You don't really have free movement to move. Mike Goulian owns the first Stodiker off the line, the prototype for the S-300. He's now working with John on the design of his next plane, one which addresses his specific needs. And uh, as far as the rudder pedals go, you had an idea there? Well, when we were flying the other night, it seems every time I, you know, do a snap and real hard, this leg will hit the, the top of the rear spar here and it get bruises on the back of my legs. At 23, Mike had hoped to be headed to the world championship, but one missed maneuver at the U.S. Nationals cost him a place on this year's team. His goal now is the 1994 team. John hopes he makes the team as well because he knows that his plane success is directly linked to Mike's. All right, well... This is John's newest experiment. The Stodiker S341. The same basic design as the S300, but with a geared engine he's designed himself. It's going to have a lot more thrust. I think the, uh, the, the geared engine, like the one found on the Sukhoi, allows John to use a larger propeller, which will give this plane a greater rate of climb. But it's, they're still going to feel the same? Yeah, I think the feel will be the same. John has been working on the prototype for more than a year. Wow, look at this. Now Mike How much fuels it will be the first to test fly it. Wow, mine only burns like 35. I can't wait to fly this thing. Though John has done some simple in-flight experiments on his own, he has not put the plane through the rigors of an intense aerobatic routine. He's anxious about its performance. He's also nervous about sending Mike up in an airplane that is relatively untested. There's probably going to be some other things that you're not used to because the airplane's so heavy, so you'll not be able to make any assumptions about the controllability of the airplane. Okay. If there are any structural or engine problems, Mike will be the first to know. Do you like the other airplane? Well, this is a dry sump system, so we don't really know. The oil pressure should uh, drop during maneuvers for a shorter period than what you're used to if everything goes as planned. But of course, keep track of it. If, if, if the oil system doesn't work, you'll see it right away. Okay, I guess you're set to go. Okay. There's some holes opening up here, and I'm quite certain you get up through them, but uh, if you go up through them, don't get lost coming down. Okay. 20 minutes of fuel? You got 20 minutes of fuel. We'll give you a call. 20 minutes, you better be back. We really can't determine what this airplane's going to be subjected to. I can tell you categorically, I don't know what's going on during a lot of these maneuvers. Uh, turn the boost pump off in order to conserve the uh, battery for landing. Affirmative, okay. Anytime you're ready to try some uh, aerobatic type maneuvers, uh, feel free to do it. Okay. seems to accelerate extremely fast from 100 miles an hour to 200 miles an hour just in, in a heartbeat it's going Mike, uh, that chattering problem you're having uh, might not be the gearbox it could have something to do with the mixture are you leaning up? Affirmative. The chattering seems serious? No, it's gone now. All right, just uh, keep track of it. Okay. It just sat on the vertical line all day. It looks like I could have went to Burger King and had lunch and come back and it'd still be going vertical. 
And I was just looking out over my shoulder like this, and the ground is just going away and going away and going away and going away. And it's climbing and climbing. I said, boy, this thing's going to slow down sooner or later. And I looked at the altimeter, and we were you know, miles above the Earth from where we started from. It was just incredible. turn the boost pump on for the first hammerhead. I did. The second one I put it on, it was okay. It seemed so, okay. most likely a vapor lock problem. I think so. I think so. Other than that, it's probably going to have to insulate the fuel system. It was really great. There was really no hard evidence that it wouldn't work. And as a matter of fact, at this particular point, it works surprisingly well. It works so good it's kind of scary. I think this is it. I, I think we might have to tweak it a little bit here or there, but uh, I don't see that this particular design has any limit. Despite the success of the flight, the real test won't come until one of his planes is flown in the world championship. Mike Goulian hopes to be in the cockpit when that happens. He knows he'll have to wait until at least 1994, but he'd still give anything to be with the U.S. team now in La Havre. La Havre, France. Opening ceremonies for the 16th World Aerobatic Championship. Seventy-five pilots from 20 nations will participate in the competition. Most teams arrived in La Havre a few days ago in order to acclimate themselves and their planes to the coastal French weather. They hope that the rain which forced the ceremonies inside isn't a sign of things to come. Now we will proceed to the drawing of lots. Philip Knight. Three events make up the championships. The order in which they'll fly for the first event is now being determined. 63. Most pilots would prefer to fly sooner than later. Cecilia Avagon. But not too soon. Judges are always reluctant to give high scores for the first few flights. 28. One is the number no one wants. Fatty Baxter. 19. Natalia Sergeyeva. Natalia Sergeyeva of Russia is one of Patty's main adversaries. 18. And now she'll be flying just before Patty. Alida Makagonova. One! Thousands of spectators have made their way to La Havre to take in the two-week event. The popularity of aerobatics among Europeans has continued since the days of the Reims Air Show, which took place not far from here. But the choice of La Havre as a competition site was controversial from the start because of its unpredictable weather conditions. Away we go. Secluded from the competition village, judges from each nation take on a challenge that rivals the job of the pilots. They give each maneuver a score from zero to ten which is then multiplied by the degree of difficulty assigned to that maneuver. Zero. How many zeros do we have on nine? No. A zeroed maneuver can so damage a pilot's overall score that the judges will confer before making it official. Two zeros. Okay. Two zeros on nine. Uh, I gave it a very low score. It certainly yeah, torqued so off. Yeah. But, uh, I don't, a pilot I don't can zero a maneuver I simply by rolling or turning no, 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 no. in the opposite direction from what the program calls for. It's not difficult to zero a maneuver. The lowest score we have... The judges will also deduct points for pilots who go outside the aerobatic box, an invisible cube that starts 300 feet off the ground and measures 3,300 feet on the side. To help the pilots stay within the box, markings are placed on the ground at the corners and center positions. The 16th World Aerobatic Championship is underway, but the high winds have forced a number of short delays. 
slowing the competition's progress. I would like you to tell me uh, some things about the uh, spades. Delays due to the wind have been frustrating for Rick Massey, uh, who was expected to have flown already. He now hopes the competition will be delayed long enough to push his flight until tomorrow, when the weather could be better. In the meantime, he gets some advice from Nikolai Timoviev, a member of the Russian team who was also one of the designers of the Sukhoi. Early in the competition, the Russians suffer a setback when the brakes on one of their planes locked on landing. Touched out at the end of the runway and rolled out about 1,500 feet. And I could hear the tires squealing. It sounded like a brake lock. There's a really good chance she had a brake lock. She's real experienced in this type of plane. Yeah. God, look at it sitting up there. Eight Russian pilots share only two Sukhois at the competition. Now, at least for the time being, one of them is out of commission. I think the women are flying the airplane. Rick Masaghi's debut on the world aerobatic stage is just minutes away. While he waits, he does a visualization exercise, a way for a pilot to perform his routine in his mind's eye. It is also the pilot's only form of preparation. They're not allowed to practice in the air once the competition begins. But the benefit of visualization is limited. The exercise does nothing to help pilots adjust their flying for the windy conditions. Is this good conditions for flying? The sun is at, at least. It's good conditions for a duck, I guess, or for a bird. I don't know if it's good conditions for me. It's windy, and it's right up to the 12-meter uh, second limit. <laughs> Finally, Rick's time has arrived. The three wing wags signal the start of the flight. Rick enters the box at about 280 miles per hour. The first maneuver in the compulsory sequence is a roll where the pilot stops every 90 degrees of rotation, a four-point roll. The second maneuver is called a Humpty Bump. Rick pushes over the top at about negative two Gs and heads straight down. Next, an outside snap roll, one of the most difficult aerobatic maneuvers. Rick performed it perfectly. Later in the program, Rick pulls to the vertical, fighting the gusting wind. His half-snap roll is a little flawed. Pushing over the top, he does a quarter roll and pushes out at the bottom of the box at negative seven or eight Gs. The wind has pushed him out of position, so he goes immediately into a half loop in order to stay in the box. Next, a double inside snap roll. The tiny adjustment of the wing at the end will cost him some points. Now Rick performs one of the most difficult aerobatic maneuvers, a rolling 360 degree turn. The pilot must continuously roll the plane while turning parallel to the ground in a perfect circle. When I pulled around for that uh, half loop, I mean, I was looking right at the marker, so I couldn't have gone another half a second further this direction. Yeah. The know, combination but, of wind and waiting and has made this a difficult contest for Rick Masaki. Still, he did not zero any maneuvers, and he anticipates his next two flights will raise his score. The upline is so long, drifted this way. And when I push out the bottom, I was center box. Now that, uh-oh, we'll, we'll find out just how the crapshoot went here in about 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well... 
I had a good time for my first world contest. Oh, you know, I didn't. No major. I've got it on tape, but you know, from this angle, uh, Kermit's is ahead of it. So later on, when you calm down and have coffee, I'll give it to you. The following day, the airfield is quiet. The sounds of competition have ceased. The wind has intensified, and clouds and rain over La Havre could interrupt the event for several days. The rules say the competition cannot be extended. And most pilots have not yet flown their compulsory sequence. We will start with the meteorological conditions. The pilots are frustrated with the weather. For the last several months, they've flown at least once a day. At the competition, some have not flown in more than a week. And the forecast is not encouraging. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning we have a warm front about the channel, which gave some rain and drizzle only uh, for the channel for the moment. For the moment, but uh, in the morning we could have some little drop. Stretches everything out. I think it helps your detolerance too. And it's been too long since oh, we have flown. This is what happens when you can't fly. It's pretty grim. Don't ever try it. Do not try this at home. Flying, that is. A few days later, the ceiling is lifted and the winds have diminished enough for the competition to resume. The stakes have been raised as well. The pilots now know that the champions will be determined based on just one flight, the compulsory program. International rules preclude the awarding of team trophies following an abbreviated contest, so the pilots are flying for individual titles only. Left snap, hit it, one, two, three, four, and I gotta nail those points. Pull out about seven, eight Gs, really aggressive. Hold the line. Patty Wagstaff's flight Pause. is just a few Pause. hours Pause. away. Hold the line. On the floor and of the US tent, one, an aerobatic and box and has been laid out two. so that she can run through her routine one line. last time. Don't fly it over, hammerhead. Hold it, half roll, hold it, and that's a 10. As Russian Natalia Sergeyeva taxis out, Patty knows that her one chance for the gold is up next. Though she'd like to study her competitor's performance, she's finding it difficult to concentrate even on her own. Natalia's flight has gone well, but it has not been flawless. The door is open for Patty. It's a small 
small group of people, basically, and we all sort of know each other, and we know the judges, but, you know, they turn the box markers from red to white, let you know that you're cleared into the box, and everything changes. Patty knows she has flown well, but the Russian women have also flown well. It felt really good to fly. It felt really strange after not after sitting on the ground for a week. You know, you're just kind of just kind of hoping that you remember everything. But it felt good. I think I did pretty good. I can always fly a little bit better, but um, I think everybody will be a little off than, they, than their normal flights. Patty put in her best performance ever at the World Contest. She won the silver medal, second only to Natalia Sergeva's teammate, Elena Klimovich, who took home the gold. In her first international contest, Cecilia Aragon placed a surprising fourth in the women's division. Bill Knight was seventh among the men and first among the Americans. Rick Masaki also placed well despite his problems with the wind. He came in 13th out of 57 pilots in the men's division. The next world championship will be held in Hungary in 1994. Members of this year's team would like to compete again, hopefully under more favorable weather conditions. Another pilot who intends to fly in Hungary is Mike Gullion. He and his colleagues are an elite group of aviators, distinguished not only for their skills and courage, but also for their love of flight. The passion that drives them to soar with the birds has inspired pioneers of the air throughout the century. It has also helped make aviation what it is today.